Triton, the alien planet that became a moon. Triton is the largest moon in the Neptune system and among the largest in the solar system. It was found on the night of October 10, 1846 by English astronomer William Lassell, just 17 days after the discovery of the planet it revolves around. Strangely and contrary to his habits, Lassell gave it no name. The one proposed in 1880 by Camille Flammarion, who named it Triton after the son of the god Neptune, remained in informal use even until 1949, when the astronomical community decided to finally make it official. A strange moon from the beginning, then a name that inspires vision of dark, icy landscapes at the edge of the solar system. One of the most alien and mysterious of known worlds. What do you say? Shall we try to explore it further? Thirty-three years ago, Voyager 2 spacecraft swept silently over the royal blue clouds of Neptune at the ragged edge of our solar system and revealed a world unlike any other. A world of wild weather, a reservoir of energy, and a place quite unlike its near twin Uranus. The tiny spacecraft's observations of Neptune turned up many more questions than answers, as it would close passage by one of the solar system's strangest moons, Triton. After passing over Neptune's North Pole, Voyager 2 headed southwards, hurtling through the giant planet's ring plane toward Triton, which had grown steadily larger over the preceding 15 months. By August 25, 1989, the moon covered more than half of the spacecraft's narrow angle lens. But despite its size, it soon became apparent that Triton was far smaller than anticipated, only 2,700 kilometers in diameter. Pre-Voyager dimension estimates based upon the amount of sunlight Triton reflected had yielded erroneous results. In fact, at that time it was speculated that Triton's diameter was even more than 5,000 kilometers, vying with Ganymede and Titan for the title of largest moon in the solar system. Image motion compensation techniques trialed at Uranus came into their own and held the spacecraft sufficiently steady to acquire some of the most astonishing map-quality photographs of the entire mission. Moving at 63,730 km per hour, Voyager 2 passed within 39,800 km of Triton's center, revealing a world of profound complexity and a spectacular conclusion to a 12-year, four-planet grand tour. In the following years, the discovery of Eris and the great media overlap associated with the downgrading of Pluto stole the show from this distant and mysterious satellite. Yet its peculiarities are truly extraordinary, both from a dynamic and physical point of view. At first glance, Triton seems to have all the makings of a natural child of the Neptune satellite system. Indeed, it always turns the same face to the gas giant, like the moon to Earth and Galilean moons to Jupiter, and its orbit is almost perfectly circular. Two features that usually stand for the fact that a satellite was formed at the same time as the planet to which it belongs. It would therefore seem impossible to see Triton an intruder. Yet, there is some oddity in its orbit that if detected would immediately make us realize that Triton could not have been born there among the other satellites of Neptune. An anomaly that considering also the important size of the object cannot but provoke disbelief. What are we talking about? Well, the fact that Triton's orbit is retrograde. Basically, Triton is like a big truck going the wrong way on the highway. A very strange thing indeed, because all larger objects, since they form from the same rotating dust disk, orbit the Sun counterclockwise. Mind you, there are other moons in the solar system that revolve around their planet in a retrograde direction, but these are tiny moons, basically small asteroids captured by planets in a variety of ways and all located on the periphery of the satellite system that received them. Triton, on the other hand, is very close to Neptune, only 350,000 kilometers, less the distance between the Moon and the Earth. Moons in retrograde orbits cannot form in the same region of the solar nebula as the planets they orbit, so Triton must have been captured from elsewhere. It might therefore have originated in the Kuiper Belt, the ring of small icy objects extending beyond the orbit of Neptune. Thought to be the point of origin for the majority of short-period comets observed from Earth, the belt is also home to several large planet-like bodies including Pluto and Eris. Triton is only slightly larger than Pluto and nearly identical in composition, which has led to the hypothesis that the two share a common origin. 
Before going on, be sure to like or dislike the video so that we can continue to improve and make these videos better for you, the viewer. Plus, be sure to subscribe to the channel by clicking the bell so that you don't miss any of our weekly videos. The most recent and widely accepted hypothesis suggests that before its capture, Triton had a mass companion similar to Pluto's satellite Charon, with which it formed a binary system. When the two bodies, probably orbiting on their own in the Kuiper Belt along a very eccentric orbit, got too close to Neptune, Triton transferred all its orbital energy to its companion, who was ejected from the system, while Triton was captured and forced to follow a retrograde orbit. This catastrophic encounter would also lead to the almost complete destruction of Neptune's satellite system. In fact, the sizes of the other 13 moons, very small objects, offer persuasive evidence that some catastrophic sequence of events may have occurred in Neptune's distant past. Unlike the other three gas giants, the planet does not have in fact a system of mid-sized moons with diameters ranging from roughly 500 to 1500 kilometers. Some astronomers have suggested that the planet did once possess a family of mid-sized moons, but that the arrival of Triton either scattered them, destroyed them, or ejected them from the Neptunian system altogether. The fact of the retrograde orbit is undoubtedly the oddity that more than the others makes Triton a dark and almost magical world worthy of a fantasy novel. But what can we say about its surface? Here Triton records another record. It is in fact the coldest body among those studied in the solar system, with a surface temperature of minus 230 degrees Celsius, colder than even Pluto. Its low temperature and non-negligible mass allows it to hold a tenuous atmosphere composed of 99% molecular nitrogen and the rest of methane and carbon monoxide. The surface pressure is less than 1 70,000ths of Earth's. At that temperature and distance from the Sun, one would expect an ice ball marked by numerous impact craters. A monotonous landscape frozen in time, but no Triton surface is constantly renewing itself. Voyager 2's highest resolution images covered only a third of Triton's surface and revealed a curious, ubiquitous, greenish terrain, which was nicknamed cantaloupe, due to its textural similarity to the rigid skin of a cantaloupe melon. Visually, this took the appearance of a series of roughly circular, interlocking depressions, each about 25 kilometers across. The cantaloupe terrain is crisscrossed by long, interconnected ridges, which are thought to have been caused by one or more epochs of melting and near-complete resurfacing of Triton. Speculations continue to abound that the heat source for this melting comes most likely from the tremendous heat associated with the moon's capture by Neptune and the subsequent circularization of its orbit. These immense tidal forces are to be responsible for substantial crustal fractures and for the melting of the moon's surface, which left large, smooth regions or filled basins and craters with lava-like flows, probably of water ice. The largest of its few visible craters named Mazomba measures only 27 kilometers in diameter, indicating the relative youth of its present surface. Spectroscopic investigations revealed the presence of ice of five different species in the soil – water, methane, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and carbon monoxide. More than half of the moon is covered with a solid solution of nitrogen with traces of methane and carbon monoxide. Water ice is probably the main component of the mantle and crust, although pools of water and frozen carbon dioxide are present on the rest of the surface studied by Voyager. Most of the features seen by Voyager 2 are believed to be solid water ice, which is frozen so hard that it has the consistency of rock at these frigid temperatures. It has been argued that liquid might still be emerging cryovolcanically from the depths of Triton freezing onto the surface and obliterating all but the very youngest craters. Volcanism had previously been seen only on Earth and on Jupiter's moon Io, but in August 1989, icy plumes of geysers and their after-effects were clearly detected on Triton. Indeed, during the flyover, Voyager 2 managed to photograph at least four active geysers, which were characterized by vertical columns of black smoke rising up to 8 kilometers in altitude and then bending parallel to the surface, driven by the prevailing winds over 100 kilometers away. This phenomenon could explain the hundred or so dark streaks formed by the deposition of fine dust that were photographed by Voyager. For some, Triton's geysers would result from a kind of greenhouse effect at work in the ice surface exposed to the sun's rays. 
Frozen nitrogen is in fact very transparent, allowing light to penetrate it for several meters. It is enough for the deeper ice to be warmed by a couple of degrees for it to sublimate, generating the pressure necessary to erupt to the surface and to project into the tenuous atmosphere a column of nitrogen crystals and dark dust consisting of organic or rocky material. No connection with endogenous activity such as that active on Europa, then, but to many other planetologists, the presence of geysers instead immediately suggested that Triton too might harbor a large ocean of liquid water under its icy crust formed by the heat of tidal friction. Tidal friction, however, is not the only source of heat within an Earth body. There is also radiogenic heating. This is the heat produced by the decay of radioactive isotopes within a moon or planet, and this process can create heat over billions of years. But doesn't heat plus water equal life? Well, the probability that life forms could develop in the depths of Triton's ocean is much smaller than in Europa, but still cannot be completely ruled out. The ammonia that is likely present in Triton's marine waters could be instrumental in lowering the freezing point of the water, thus making it more conducive to supporting life. Needless to say, however, these are only suppositions, probably destined to remain so until an automated mission can reach the surface of the big moon. Already in 2019, a possible mission was proposed to be launched in 2025 to reach Neptune and Triton in 2038. Nicknamed Trident for its three-pronged goals, the mission would probe the magnetic field to determine the presence of an ocean, map the entirety of the surface, and use a camera to gauge the activity of plumes. In 2021, however, NASA preferred to prioritize missions to Venus, also believing that simply flying over Triton by the Trident probe would not bring significant scientific results. Currently under approval is the Neptune Odyssey. Proposal targets a launch in 2033 using the Space Launch System and a 16-year cruise directly to Neptune, with launch windows yearly during the 2030s. The cruise could be shortened to 12 years with gravity-assisted Jupiter, but this would require a launch before 2032. A 220 kilogram atmospheric probe will be released from the orbiter before orbital insertion at Neptune and descend 37 minutes into Neptune's atmosphere to study its composition, dynamics, and processes. After achieving Neptune orbit, the orbiter will conduct at least 46 flybys of Triton over the four-year main science phase achieving near-global coverage of the moon while simultaneously studying Neptune and other moons. The orbiter would then orbit progressively closer to Neptune and its rings on a grand finale, similar to the grand finale of Cassini, and eventually be destroyed in Neptune's atmosphere for planetary protection purposes. But these are all things that will happen perhaps 20 years from now, and a future that seems beyond our reach at the moment. For now, all we can do is travel with our imagination and lose ourselves among those mysterious and immensely remote places.